Well, how many of you recognize that guy? That's about what I looked like when I preached my first sermon. I know things really get better with age, thank you. <laughs> I'm about 17 years old, and our youth group is going down to the Detroit City Rescue Mission to do the service. And the pastor came to me and asked me if I would do the sermon. Of course, I was young, and I was like, I'll do anything. <laughs> And so, yes, I said, I'll do, this, do the service. And so there I was at the Detroit City Rescue Mission. I'd worked on my sermon, and uh, I'd come to a pa passage in the Old Testament I liked a lot. And I started my sermon out with a rhetorical question. I said, who was Naaman? And one of the guys jumped up and said, Naaman who? Now, I wasn't expecting that, so that kind of startled me a little bit, and, 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 but I, I kept going on. You see, Naaman is mentioned in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 5, and it says he was a mighty man. He was a great man of valor, and uh, even though he's a Syrian general, probably five-star, I don't know if they had stars back then, but, but he, he represents the uh, kingdom of Aram or Syria, and he's been attacking Israel. <laughs> And he's been victorious. God has let him be victorious against his own people because his own people were so wicked at that time. And in the process, the text tells that in all of his, his glory, he had one glaring bad feature. It says he was a leper. He was a leper. Leprosy was the cancer of the Old Testament. Uh, you did not want to get it. It starts out as a little white spot. Maybe it's on your finger or on your hand. And then it just continues to grow and gets bigger and bigger. And pretty soon it eats away your flesh and that part of your body would drop off. Now, if it were a hand that wasn't so unsightly, you could always cover up your hand. But when it was your nose or an ear, it became very unsightly. And, and so he's got leprosy. There's no known cure for leprosy. Well, so when I'm preaching as a 16-year-old kid, I'm saying, because I want to be very tactful. I mean, you saw the picture of me. I look like a junior high kid and all these older men in the audience. And I want to be very tactful about how I was bringing about the fact that we're all sinners. And so I'm saying, well, sin is a lot like leprosy. Once you get it and it, you know, it, it, it just goes everywhere and you, there, there was no cure for it. And the guy jumps up while I'm talking about my real tactful approach. And he said, we're all sinners. <laughs> and he sat down and went off to sleep on me. <laughs> he stole my thunder. So I make my way to the fact that leprosy is like sin. And sin, once it's in you, it'll ultimately take your life. The wages of sin is death. But Naaman had captured while he was in battle and, and had captured some, some slaves. And he brought one home, and one of the slaves uh, he gave to his wife. And, and his wife, um, obviously, Naaman was a, a, a good guy because even though the, the girl is a slave, she says to her, her mistress master, says, I wish to God that my master, Naaman, was in Israel because there's a man of God there who can heal him. Whoa. Now, Naaman goes to the king and tells the king this. He said, go, go and ask for him. And so, of course, Naaman, wanting to be cured, like I would think anybody who's a sinner would want to be cured, and I'm relating this back and forth in my sermon. I'm not giving the whole sermon here. I'm digesting, okay? You could tell already at 16 years old, I was long-winded. I was, I was telling the story how then Naaman goes to the king of Israel and says, okay, I'm told that you can cure me. And he rips his robe and he gets all upset because he, he's sure that the king of Syria sent Naaman asking for this request so that he won't be able to do it. And then he'll start a war with him again because he hasn't cured uh, his general that's got this disease. And so he's all upset, but he, he, Elisha the prophet hears, and he sends a message to the king, and the king says, send him, I mean, Elijah's message says, king, send him to me. And so that's what he did. He sent Naaman the leper 
to Elisha. And when he arrives at the house, Elisha sends a messenger out to him, a servant, and says, I'll go tell him to go dip in the, the Jordan River seven times and he'll be well. That angered Naaman. You know why? He's a general. He gives orders. And he's really expecting him to show him a little respect. He's a general of Syrian army. And so he doesn't come out and he says, he's really angry. Naaman's angry. He said, surely I thought that he would come out and he would raise his hand or he'd wave them over and he'd pray and it would be cured. Isn't that the way it is? We have on our mind how God's supposed to do things. So he goes off in a storm, but he had brought a servant with him. And the servant says, whoa, whoa, hang on, Naaman. If he told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Wouldn't you have done it? And it comes to him, yeah, if he told me to build a great monument, I would have built it. If he told me I needed $50,000 to give to him, I'd have given it to him, whatever it takes, I would have done it. He says, well, why don't you just go do something so simple? So here's the picture in the scriptures. Naaman changes his mind. He goes down to the water, and his complaint was, are not the rivers in Damascus much cleaner than the dirty Jordan River? I don't know if you know anything about the Jordan River. It's not exactly clean. It's kind of a muddy, murky thing. And the Abana and the Farpar River of Damascus were much cleaner. And he's saying, I'm going to go down to the dirty rivers of Israel, and I'm going to dip in them, and I'm going to get well. But he says, okay, that's what the man of God said. He goes down. It makes no sense to do this. So he goes down, and he dips himself in it, and he comes up. And I'm sure if it was on his hand, he looks at it and says, nothing happened. Okay, do it again. Goes down. Can you see about three or four times? It's not changing at all. What's the deal here? Five times, six times. Comes up. You could have at that point said, this is not working and stormed off. But the text says he dipped the seventh time and he came up whole. Isn't that beautiful? And my application as a 16-year-old teenager is this. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that if I believe in Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses me from all sin. That makes no logical sense in the world in which I live. I believe and I'm, I'm cleansed of my sin and my soul. And yet if I do that, that is the gospel truth. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, you'll be cleansed, you'll be made whole, not in your body of leprosy, but in your soul of the leprosy of sin, and you will be cured. That's the gospel even found in the Old Testament. Come on. I come to 1 Peter, or 2 Peter. And it's talking about a living faith has God's remedy. It has God's remedy. Here's, here's what I mean. We left off last week. In 2 Peter 2.9, the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trial. And the next part says, and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. He's saying, listen, you can either do it God's way or your way. And there's consequences to how you do this. That's where we left off. A living faith has God's remedy to the problems that we have. Here's the first thing is, we all have a leprosy of sin that has infected us. Every last single human being is a sinner. In fact, Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, in the garden, and death through sin, when he sinned, he died spiritually immediately, but later died physically too. In the same way, death came on all men, and an unusual statement, because all sinned, past tense. And the idea of this passage is this was original sin. When Adam sinned, the whole human race sinned at that moment. He was the whole human race. There was nobody else. Him and Eve, then they, they both sinned. It says when they sinned, they plunged the whole race into sin so that when they had children, guess what kind of children they had? Sinful children. My original sin was I was there in Adam as part of the human race. I sinned. I came into this world a sinner. Even David says so in Psalm 51. And sin, my mother conceived me. Ooh, and sin, and sin. Here's the deal. All have sinned, and sin has infected all of mankind. 
And so when I was born, I was born with a sinful nature. Man's nature is infected with sin. So we pick up at verse 10, the sinful nature it talks about. So I got this kind of a shadowy guy there because, you know, that's the way. Uh, Adam at the beginning was pure, he was clean, but when he sinned, he got the sin nature. It was a sinful human nature. The human nature that was sinless prior now became sinful, and he's passed that on to all of us. And in this context, he's talking about these false prophets and false teachers in the church. He says this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature. They're giving you false doctrine, and if you're following that, it's because you're following it out of your sinful nature and not wanting to follow God. Now, the sinful nature, he says, is a corrupt nature. It has been corrupted. It's corrupted every facet of my being. Not just my body, so that it's dying and growing old, but my desires, what I want, what I think, what I do. Everything is contaminated and polluted by the corruption of sin that's entered into my, my experience as being born in humanity. He says, but they're following those corrupt desires. He goes on and he says, not only that, they're anarchists. They despise authority. You know the number one authority they despise is God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. <laughs> We're anarchists. They're, they're uh, anti-Christian. They're anti-God. They're atheists. They're, he says, that is the inclination of the sinful nature of humanity. We've been infected with that. They're bold and arrogant. You know what it is? They think, well, I can be God myself. Who needs God? I can be God. Isn't that what he tempted Eve with? Hey, the day you eat of the fruit, you're going to be just like God. So then she looks, it's beautiful, it's pleasant to the eyes. It's going to make her wise. She takes because she's become bold and arrogant in God, against God. The next one is it's slanderous. These men, now talking about the teachers, he's saying, they're not afraid to, slay, to slander celestial beings. They're slandering and saying false things about the immaterial, invisible world of angels and demons, and they're slandering, saying wrong things about them. Yet even the angels, though, are stronger and more powerful. Believe me, the angels are stronger and more powerful than you and me. He says, even those angels, they do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. They wouldn't think for a moment to do that. In fact, if we were to go to Jude 9, chapter 1, verse 9. But even the archangel Michael... He's up there in the top echelon of all the angels. He says, even Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, that's Satan, about the body of Moses, did not dare bring a slanderous accusation against him, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't dare say, I'm going to rebuke you, Satan, as if he is more powerful than Satan. He's saying, whoa, why do we say such slanderous things? about those who are in authority over us. Wow. I think that comes right down to, you know, politics is just a mudslinging contest. Both sides, all they do is try to dig up dirt, or they invent the dirt to throw on the other side. Just watch any political ad, it's always negative, 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 negative. It is just the way it is. He's saying, whoa, angels, angels don't do this because they know that the other, the other one's more powerful than they. What are you thinking? Not only is man's nature, okay, infected, that means his mind is infected too. Stupid is as stupid does. Huh? But these men blaspheme in matters they don't understand. Phew. They make slanderous accusations against God whom they don't even understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct. 
born only to be caught and destroyed. And like beasts, they too will perish. It's like the person who doesn't vote on the issues, but I've always voted a Republican, I've always voted a Democrat, and I don't care what the issues are. I'm just going to vote the way I've always done because they're just a brute beast who follows the instinct. Well, my parents were Democrats, or my parents were Republicans, and I am one too. I guess I was just born into that. Or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Baptist because my parents were Baptists, and, and I am too. You see, it's like, whoa, what is the issue here? The, the, the animal acts according to instinct. Are you acting according to instinct? Are you acting upon the issues of what it is? Do you understand? Do you understand? The mind is infected. He says, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Ooh. Warning, warning. You're going to be paid back for what you have done. Listen. Listen. The same morning goes like this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so if I'm going to think this way, that's what I'm going to become. If you want to become something different than you are, then you're going to have to start with what you're thinking in your head. It all starts there. He goes on and he says, listen, a man reaps what he sows. This is what Paul says. The one who sows to please his sinful nature... He's just going to gratify that sinful nature, that fallen side of him, the dark side. From that nature, he will reap destruction. It's going to take you down. If Naaman had said, I am not going to do what God, the, the man of God said, I'm going to do it my way, he'd have died from his leprosy. It's just that simple. He would have reaped what he, what he sowed. Now, the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. But the fact was, he said, I am going to do what God says. And he came up the seventh time completely doing what God said. And he was, he was cured. He was cured. Just like that. Not only is his nature infected and his mind is infected, but also his pleasures are infected. What pleases him and what he desires, because that's what the text says. The idea of pleasure is to uh, <clears throat> carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, revealing in their pleasure, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. <clears throat> it is open, blatant, just all out, all about me. And what makes me happy, what pleases me, you know, if they had had the iPhone back then, they'd have carried it around on that selfie stick the whole time. Because it's all about me. What makes me happy? What gives me a thrill? What makes me... That's why we have a drug problem in America. Jesus is the solution to all these things. You're going to see that when we turn the corner in this message. Jesus is the solution. Listen. Man's morals are also infected. His morals. He says, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. Oh. They are a slave to their sins. We'll see that next week. They offer freedom, but they don't give you freedom. You are enslaved. They never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood, oh, a family that's been cursed. It's affected, infected man's love. Lo man's love is also infected. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. Now, some of you are probably familiar with the story of Balaam the son of Beor. It's found in Numbers chapters 20 through through 25. And, and he's a, a Gentile prophet. And, and Balak, the king of Moab, sees the Israelites and, and, and he wants them to be cursed. So he sends for Balaam to come and curse the Israelites. <clears throat> and so when he first come to him, God told him, don't do it. And so he says, I'm not going with you no matter what. 
And then they come back and they're offering him a great sum of money. You're, you're gonna, we're gonna, we'll reward you if you'll just come and, and, and you'll curse these people coming out of Egypt. We, we know that you can do that. You can curse it and, and bring a curse down upon them. And, and <clears throat> so he's really tempted by this and uh, because of all the, the extra perks for doing that. And, and yet he's a prophet of God. You know, there are some people in the ministry for the wrong reason. This passage, for the love of wages. Jude talks about the same thing. They have rushed to profit, uh, r- rushed for profit into Balaam's heir. So the second time they come, the Lord says, okay, you want that? You go with them. And so he's on his way. And all of a sudden, his donkey that he's riding on, the donkey just stops and kind of throws him. He gets a stick and he beats that donkey. He gets back on, he starts again, donkey throws him again. Boom, he gets that stick, man, and he beats that donkey. I mean, he is angry that donkey's not following his command. He does it again, he bangs into the wall, and he gets off and he beats the donkey a third time, and the donkey turns around and the donkey talks to him. The donkey says, why are you beating me? Now, then he answers him. Now, this is the strangest thing. The donkey is speaking to him, and he's talking back to the donkey. If the donkey were talking to me, I mean, we've been to the zoo. In fact, last year we were at the zoo, the John, John Ball, out in Grand Rapids, beautiful zoo. And we're there, and there's a glass panel, and the grandkids leaning up against it, and a bear comes walking right by pushing on the glass as he walks by. We got a beautiful picture of that. I should have put it in these. But if that donkey, I mean, if that bear would have turned and said, hey, kid, move it. I'm not sure I'd be talking to the, 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 the bear. I'd be grabbing the kid and getting out of there, right? He talks back. He talks back. Then the text tells us, boom, his eyes were opened and he saw what the donkey saw, but he didn't see, the angel of the Lord in the path. And he said, boy, if you hadn't have stopped, you'd gotten killed. I'd have killed you. And it's at that moment, Balaam says, I have sinned. When you're on a mission to do God's work other than for God, listen to me, that's a terrible place to be in. If you want to profit from doing something for the Lord, you want to profit personally from it, when you're just supposed to be sharing the good news of Jesus, that is a personal thing. Listen to what it says. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey. I think some of the older trans- translations had, they were, they were, he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by an ass. A donkey. A beast without speech who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophets. Here it is. Madness. You see what the problem here is? He has a love for money over a love for the Lord. Whoa. It's a terrible thing when Christians' ministries become about money and not about the good news of Jesus Christ. Sad day. Sad day. Now, if there were only a cure for all this leprosy of the soul, if there were only a cure, and I'm here to tell you, there is a cure. There is a cure. And here's the beautiful part. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been united to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that person is a new creation. He says here, the old is gone and the new has come. Jesus is the antidote. You just have to have Jesus and he changes everything. Here's what I mean. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you get a new nature, a whole new nature. Wow. His divine power has given us everything we need. I'm telling you right now, you need to get rid of the old nature. He's given you a new nature for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called you by his own glory and goodness. He's given us everything that we need through our knowledge of him. Our knowledge comes from the word. He called us. 
not on a phone, but he called us from a small, still voice within saying, you need to come to me and believe in me. And you did. He says, through these, he has given us very great and precious promises and hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. What? He's given me the promise of eternal life, and he cannot lie, Titus 1, 2. These very great promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. (laughs) My old sinful nature has been bumped aside. I've gotten a new nature that's connected to Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians, dwells in my heart by faith. My body's become the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in me. And if anyone has not the Holy Spirit, he doesn't belong to Christ. So the moment you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. You have a new nature. He's given you everything you need for godliness. It's right there in the text. You don't have to be the person who always caves into the old sinful nature. Not only that, we escape corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Those evil desires that were coming up, he says, listen, they're caused by that sinful, corrupted nature, but you escape all that. Why? Because you have Jesus in you, the hope of glory, Paul says. Paul says, now, practically speaking, that's your position in Christ. You've got a new nature, but the truth is you still have your old nature because you're still in your body. One day you're going to be glorified and it's going to be dominated by the new nature. The old nature will be totally eradicated and you're going to always do what is right, but until then you've got to struggle in your life. And I do too. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, that is, in the old sinful nature and its habits. To put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, same thing Peter's talking about. And instead of just, you don't just put it off, he says, now you got to put on, jump down to verse 24, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the life struggle of the Christian. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. I got a new nature, but the old nature wants to raise its ugly head and dominate me, and I got this constant struggle. I need to put off the old guy. I don't know, maybe he looks like a hippie. Maybe you were a hippie earlier. And it's, it, the metaphor is like, you just take those clothes off. You just take that old guy off. You throw him over there, you put him in a hamper, or you put him in a, a, a basket, a container, and you burn it, and you say, that's not me anymore. I'm not the old guy I used to be. He says, and you put on. You know, for a little discretion here, I put him behind the screen. Oh, he's throwing off the old stuff, man. He's just throwing that junk off. Whoa. He says, I don't want to be the person I used to be. And then he goes and he puts on the new stuff. And he comes out a whole different person. You know, I always thought about actually setting up a screen and wearing some really tore up, maybe Michigan State clothes. (laughs) Then then I'd go behind the screen and I'd whip all those things off, put on my Michigan stuff and come out on the other side to make the point. And you know that I'm just trying to be funny here. But my main concern would be while I'm halfway done, that screen would fall over and I'd really be ashamed. (laughs) Do you get the picture here, though? When I became a Christian, I got a new nature that is at war with my old nature. Everything becomes new when I'm walking in the Spirit and I'm following Jesus. But when I depart and I step myself into the world, I'm not following Him, I put those old clothes back on and I act like the old guy. He says, that's not who you are. Live who you are in Jesus. He's given us a new mind. Listen, this is how it works. We just looked at those two verses. You put off, you put on, but sandwiched in between. To be made new in the attitude of your mind. It all starts up here. The word repentance simply means changing your mind. Metanaeo, change mind. You change your mind. That's where it starts. There's something I don't like in my life because I know it's always got me down. You've got to change your mind. That's not you just don't like it. It's sin and you need to get rid of it. It needs to be eradicated. You need to take that off for good and you need to put on the new. He said, it all starts in your mind. Listen, you need a new mind. He says, 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed, metamorphous. Remember the movie, The Incredible Hulk? Meek, mild manner. I think his name is Steve Bannon. And he goes through, Bruce, yeah, okay. And he goes, he goes through this metamorphous process when he gets angry and he changes over into this big, huge, incredible Hulk. That's kind of what God wants us to do. We need to get angry about sin and go through the metamorphous process of becoming out a godly person. And all takes place, he says, by renewing your mind, then you will be able to approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul puts it this way. You just got to change what you think about. Finally, brothers, whatever is true. Is it true or is it false? Is it noble? Does it show the nobility of God? Is it right or is it wrong? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Do godly people admire that which you're thinking about? Hmm. If there's any excellence or praise, anything praiseworthy about it, ah, think about those kinds of things. Change what you think on. Change the station on the TV so they don't put the junk in your mind. Change the books you read so you're not putting it in your mind. Spend more time in the Bible. Listen, the Bible is X-ray, X-rated enough. I mean, there's a lot of evil, sin, and Bible, but then there's the good news always. The good news always triumphs. If you're not sure about that, jump to the end of the book, Jesus Reigns. It all starts in your mind. He's given us a new mind. I like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, says, but we have the mind of Christ. When I think God's thoughts after him, I have the mind of Christ. Wow. You see, God has provided everything we need for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. He's actually given us a new pleasure. Things, different things please me now than they did before. In Romans, it says this, in Romans chapter 8. Those controlled by the sinful nature. Oh, we were talking about that. That's the old me. They cannot please God. Why? I'm self-pleasing. The old me only wanted to please me. I I was a selfie dentist. I was just a child, but I always wanted my way over my brother's way. I wanted my parents' affection, not my brother's or my sister. It was me, 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 me. You know, every kid. We're born into the world this way because we are sinners by nature. We're born that way. You don't have to teach a child to take a toy from another kid. That comes all comes naturally. I want it, I take it. it just, he says, everything was self-pleasing. You cannot please God. Not without Christ. You cannot please God. But, in 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, we are not trying to please men, but we're trying to please God. Something takes place. When you have the Lord Jesus Christ enthroned in your heart, it is no longer all about me, but it becomes about him. You see, God's given us everything. He's given us even a new pleasure because he's given us a new heart. Brother, my heart's desire, he says, and my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. they were persecuting him. <laughs> he, he used to be like them, persecuting the church. And then when he became a Christian, they began persecuting him. And he doesn't want to retaliate. That's gone. That's now gone. Because it's not about him anymore. You see, his desires are changed. He says, my heart's desire. And he adds, and my prayer to God for Israel, who's out to get me, is that they may be saved. They may be saved. At one point he says, I'd be, I'd be gladly accursed if they would be saved. He changes what pleases us from the inside out. We, we have new desires, new pleasures. He gives us a whole new moral or morality. Jesus put it this way, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. <laughs> I don't know what you crave or desire as a dessert. 
Some of you are pie people. Some of you are cake people. Uh, and some are ice cream people. Uh, and some, you know, you can just go down line. Everybody knows what it is. And this gal is craving. And, and Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're craving for that which is right. That should be every single Christian craving what is right. Man, it would change everything. It changed the politics for sure if all the Christians just craved what is right. This whole new moral, they're craving God's fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit, most of you know these. We've been over them in the past. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They are desiring those things instead of all the works of the flesh. Envy, greed, covetousness, adultery, fornication, homosexuality. You just go on down the list. No, they desire, a, have a whole new moral and morality about them. They're desiring and they're craving all this good stuff and no longer the old evil stuff. But he's also given us a new love. I, I just love this passage. We, we memorized it earlier in the year. God has poured out his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. The moment I got saved, God poured his love inside me. You know what? It's, it's up to me to get that love out, to love the Lord back, to love my neighbor as myself. It's all there. It's all there. We all have it. We love because he first loved us. I didn't love him first. He loved me, and he poured that in me, and now it's in there that I love. Here, what it all comes down to. It all comes down to this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, and the new has come. We are new people, and people notice it. They know we're different than we used to be because Christ has done a work in us. Here's what it comes down to. I was infected with, and I need to put off the old sinful nature because the cure is found in the new nature. I, I, I had a corrupt mind, but I need to put off the old corrupt mind and change the way I think in my new mind. I, I was, used to be a self-pleasing person. That was the old me, but I need to put that off and be a God-pleasing person. I used to have an immoral lifestyle, but now I have a new morality in Jesus. I used to love money, but now I have a new love for God, and money is only a tool to love God. Next week, we have Faith Promise. Faith Promise Sunday. It's Pledge Sunday. And I'm going to say, God... I am promising to give to you, based upon your blessing, 10% for the next year. However you bless me, I'm going to give that to you. And I'm guessing it'll be this amount, and I put that down. It's my faith promise. Because I love you back, God. I don't love the money. I love the God of the money, which is you, Almighty God. And I make that commitment. I, I give it to the Lord. Listen, Second Peter says this. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and to be a godly person through our knowledge of him, knowing Jesus, who has called us by his own glory and goodness. I love that verse. Isn't that a great verse? Goes on in the next verse and says this, through these things he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the new nature, the divine nature, that one that's connected with God, that you're a new creature, a new person in Jesus Christ. Wow, powerful passage today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, from a passage like this, we know the cure is found in Jesus. And if there's someone here that has not accepted Jesus as Savior, we pray that right now they would say, Lord, I need to get rid of the old me and have a new me. Jesus, you're the cure. Your blood washes away my sin. I accept the gift of eternal life through the blood of Jesus Christ, your son. Save me. Lord, any prayer expressing such faith, 
will impart a new nature, a new desire, a new mind, a new heart, a new love. There'll be a new person in Jesus Christ. The old will fall away and the new will take its place. That's how we know that it's genuine in our lives. For us who have been a Christian for years and we perhaps have dabbled with one foot in the world and one for you, we pray, Lord, that today we'd realize we can have victory over the world. You've given us everything we need for this life and for godliness. Help us, O oh God, by your Spirit to utilize everything you've given us. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.